G'day, welcome back to Project Brewpig. We got heaps of work done this week. We fired up Rolling Thunder, our sand sieve. We put a ton of sand through there so that we can get some blasting going on to this new steel. We had a big tidy up underneath the boat. Um, we've got fire season and cyclone season happening, so we wanted to make sure that the boats were good for that. And finally, the piece de resistance. The front of the boat, we welded it up. We started working on the floor inside that crash bulkhead. This is our last summer here, so um, this is the last big push for work. So we actually don't need to hold on to stuff. So. Yeah, we're able to get rid of quite a bit of stuff. Yeah. Dame and I went to pick up some sand for the sandblasting this week. So the next part, we're going to get in there and start veeing out this weld with a grinder. Now I'll show you how we do that. There's a trick. So, old grinding disc. Basically what you want to do is you don't want to use a new one, you want an old one. And the reason being is because that edge you can sort of see there, where are we? It's basically rounded off as, as you'd expect with an old disc. And it works perfect to get in the weld and basically open that gap right up again. So, hence you want to save your old discs if you're ever doing a lot of this work. So this gives you an idea um, of how far down we go. So you can sort of see there's some areas we could have maybe gone a bit more. You can sort of see there's a line um, still between the two plates, but that's probably thin enough that it'll melt out because we're going to do a fairly hot weld all the way down here. So that plate's ground right the way around, ready to go. So we'll get the welder down. We'll start squirting some metal onto this. wind comes through and it'll... Do you need um, to stop and do a Yeah, it's, it's my borderline. Body. I've got to grind that out. Wind come up. Yeah.
we got a heap of sandblasting that we need to do over the next um, sort of three weeks. So we got another load sitting in the back of the truck here. Trev sorting out rolling thunder so that we can start sieving up a decent amount of sand. Jess over the back, where are we? Jess is digging out our, um, our we use 60 litre black plastic drums to store all of the dry sieved sand. So I'll show you our process that we're going to be working through. The black bins that Jess is pulling out here, you can see these basically black rubbish bins here. That's what we store the sand in, however, um, these got some water in and the bottom third is wet sand, top third is dry sieved sand. So what we're going to do, this is new sand we just picked up and this is slightly damp, so we're going to dump the wet sand on top of that and just let it dry. We're going to empty the trailer of sand, we're going to sieve that and put it into the black plastic buckets and then we're going to empty the ute back into the trailer. So there's um, quite a bit of sand shoveling about to happen. This is the setup we ended up. We got Trev's car hooked up to the big orange tarp and then we got our truck holding it out. So now we've got a wee bit of space you can sort of see under there. There's a decent amount of shade we can work away and hopefully get this finished. And this is our system. So dry river sand. So this is um, freshwater river sand from silica. It's silica free because it's from a river. We have our rolling thunder cement mixer with um, sieve modification and then a little collector bucket thing and then it goes straight down into our 60 litre buckets. How's the welder going? Yeah, it's running, it's running way better now. Yeah, so what I'm doing, I've gone around and welded the whole thing and I need to go and find areas that I'm not happy with. So it could be like porosity where the, the wind is blowing away the shielding gas, the argon from the welder. If that happens, you get little pinholes all through the weld. So I have to grind that weld back out and start again. You can't have porosity in the weld because it's a weak point. Other areas, so then along the bottom here, I've not had the right technique. And basically what's happened is you might be able to see it just on the top of the weld, there's, um, it's basically melted the steel away. So it's called, I think it's called undercut from memory. Just up in here on the top. So basically what that means is that there's this edge of the steel gets a bit hot and, it, and the weld sort of falls down with gravity. I'm not happy about that so I might do a bit of a grind in that and just um, fill that up with a, with a weld across the top of there. Um, and you've got to be that pedantic about these because this is the hull, it's underwater so... If someone was a qualified welder and they knew what they were doing they could probably do this in one burst without having to do this but I'm not a qualified welder so, I, so that's why I end up getting a bit more mainly retentive at the end and actually go through and try and like critique my work really harshly just find anything that I can find that's wrong with it um, mainly because I want to have 100% confidence when we start hitting ice that the front's not going to open up but also I don't know enough to know if it's safe or not so I over I over engineer it if I can like I, I underestimate the quality of my work so that I make sure that I do more than what I think is needed it's pretty important um uh, positioning for the hull because yeah look right on the, the corner there yeah um, the this, front this is the area that basically takes all the brunt of the impact you know but we're gonna we're gonna have this plated aren't we so yeah. it will be protected more than the, 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 this so there'll be there'll be 300 series stainless plating plating along the, the um, side of the boat um, for abrasion resistance and um, basically just so that we've got a bit more stiffness on the hull we're also going to put double ribs in, so every, in between every original rib we're going to do a duplicate. So at the moment the ribs are 450 mils apart, so they're about sort of that far apart. And we're going to make them roughly 225 mil. Um, so it'll be, it doesn't add a huge amount of weight by doing the extra ribs, but it adds a massive amount of strength. It, it, it adds a lot of stiffness. 
But that's not now, that's when we haul out the second time. That's our second haul out. So yeah. for now it's basically get the boat in the water and use it and see what works and what doesn't. And then second haul out is sort of perfecting the boat so that we're ready to go to the ice. Waterproof. I was just saying to Damon, it's so weird because every time I move something, I remember a job that got done from that thing, you know. Like every, every, every bit's kind of got this memory and it's a job that took hours or weeks or even months and, and it just sits there like it's nothing. Everything just sort of gets absorbed, doesn't it? It's sort of swallowed by the boat, it's so big. Danger Cam 1 got a bit of an upgrade today. So um, you can maybe see the lens has got bits of splatter all over it. That's from welding. But I got this aluminium case that has a uh, hot shoe for the light at the top. And it means that I can take this little filter off. That filter is a glass filter that's like a dollar each. I've got a new one of these coming to clear up those things. But it means that I can actually get the camera right in there for welding and not kill it. So hopefully... We'll have a decent well cam happening shortly. We're just about set up and ready to start plasmering. Thank you. 
Yeah, yeah, this is a this is a good position to find stuff, but there's nothing in the more than that's brilliant. I'm gonna do that. Yeah. What's your first impressions? Oh, this? relief, it's really good. Yeah. You happy with the condition? Yeah, I think there's um surface a bit of surface rust and it looks like paint with a little bit of rust underneath. Yeah. But it looks like yeah, it just feels really solid in there. Everything's really still well formed and welds up fine and right. Yeah, no, huge relief. So, so what do you want us to do? We'll bash it out a bit and then we'll put some rust kill on it again. Yeah, I would. I just give it a really good bash out and yeah. then yeah, just cover it and put it close it back up. Right. Yeah. Do you need to close it up? I suppose it was already a hole. No. Could you just leave the hole there? Yeah, because yeah. once we seal the floor and it's yeah. irrelevant. So yeah. that's good. So we can always just do a little glance and check in. Yeah. If yeah. we ever had to. Yeah. Okay, cool. So with that cut through, we need to go in there now. Um, we're going to use this guy. Little air chisel. Um, the reason we're using that is because it's the smallest tool that we have that'll do the job. So normally I like to use my big hammer drill. It's 10 times faster than a needle gun or a air chisel. But the air chisel is the only thing that'll really fit in there. So there's not that much drama as you can sort of see from that footage. There's not that much drama in there. But what I want to do is bash off any areas where the paint's not holding and there's obviously rust underneath. And then I'm going to put some rust kill on that. Um, I'll check the depth and everything to make sure that the rust hasn't gone through too far but it doesn't look initially that it's that bad. I know I said that about the bloody rust that we've just repaired but we'll see how we go with this front. So the stainless tread plate that we cut out of the floor in that corner when we did the hull repair, um, geez, probably two weeks, three weeks ago now, when we cut that bit out, we don't know where on earth it's gone. We've had a tidy up on our steel area since then um, and it's vanished. So I don't have any uh, tread plate, but I've got some just flat plate. Um, it's in the corner, it's stainless, it's fine, it's not going to be a big deal. So I'm going to go through and template that out now and figure out exactly what I need to make. Um, and I'll go and plasma out some stainless down the bottom. So this is our plate of stainless that we cut out. That's the gap that we've got to fit it into. So we'll get in, we'll start sizing this up. It probably needs a few trims up with the grinder and maybe even the plasma, depending on how bad I've done it. Um, but we'll basically get that to fit in there and then we'll start tacking it in and then weld that in. Once we've got that in, we can start going through and doing rust kill on all the areas. But you can sort of see that plate there is blasted maybe two weeks ago with wet blasting and you can sort of see how slow that surface rust develops. So it's not a it's not a fast thing, it's not something we have to jump on straight away. If we're welding, it's pretty easy to weld onto that stuff without any contamination into our welds. So what the plan is, is once we've got the stainless um, right around the rim here, um, sorted, like welded in and so on, we'll go underneath and we'll get into where you can see down the bottom, we sandblasted that big patch down the bottom where there was a little bit of surface rust breaking through the paint. Um, we'll go through and we'll rust kill that. Um, what we are also thinking of is welding in, I don't know if I'll do this, but I am thinking about welding in a piece of uh, mild steel, just leaving it unpainted so that takes the brunt of the rust um, to take all the oxygen out of this area as well. Bit of trimming to do, you can see over here we've got a couple of little bits to nip out just so that we can get it to fit easier. And then right down the back um, I've missed a line so I need to just trim that bit off as well. So once we've done that it should start fitting in a bit easier. So we're ready to start welding. We've got our 309 wire hooked up to the welder. We've got our vacuum cleaner hooked up as our extraction fan for the uh, argon that goes right down the bottom. So you can see there's an aluminium pipe that goes right down the very bottom there, the rubber hose at the bottom of it. 
and that basically vacuums out any any argon and things that accumulate in the bottom of that tank so that we can weld without uh, worrying about gas. We'll start putting that floor in and then we can start putting in the big triangle piece that we cut out a while back. So part one, welded in. So this is our new corner. Um, basically, as, as I said earlier, we lost the tread plate, so we've just put in a piece of flat stainless. It's not really the end of the world. Um, what I need to do now is go through, and you can see that, that if I look vertical, you can see that the um, this floor where my foot is just here doesn't line up with the new stainless. So um, what I'm going to do is put the if I spin around. That is the original floor that we cut out, that's sitting in the shelf in the anchor room. So I need to stick that down on the floor, where you can sort of see where it fits into that big hole. I need to stick that on the floor and then mark around where it doesn't fit on that side, and get, uh, grab the plasma and go and cut that corner out again. So it's probably a good time to tell you about some of the future modifications that we're doing in this room. We'll have this done within the next few days, but I don't necessarily know if it'll be on this episode, but it'll give you an idea as to what we're doing and why we're doing it now. So one of the issues with Brewpeg, it used to have smaller anchors on it, and we've, we've decided that we're putting bigger anchors. So the anchors that we're using are 110 kgs, so they've got quite a long shank. As a result, we had to move our anchor winch back. Now, what that meant is where the original, it's come back, I'm looking at it now, it's probably come back maybe two feet, two and a half feet, so it's a decent amount. Where the, where the chain used to come through the deck and drop into a shelf in the anchor room, um, that shelf that I showed you earlier that had the stainless tread plate sitting on it, basically it used to fall in the middle of that shelf, and that was fine, it would, it would fall in a big cone and sort of dump around a wee bit and whatever, it wasn't perfect, but it worked, you know. Um, and uh, we've, because we've moved the, the winch back, the chain would fall in front of the back of the shelf, but only by about maybe three inches or so, and then so it would it would pile up and then it would fall over the back of the shelf and crash down onto the floor and it was a real nightmare to try and make it actually work. So we're making some modifications because that's not going to work. We need it to be, you know, something that we don't even have to think about and we know it's going to um, drop down in there and not sort of bind up and be an issue. So one of the things that we're going to be doing is cutting out the anchor shelf. Um, we're actually going to let it fall all the way down to the floor. We're going to be lining all of this um, with hardwood so that it won't take it, the steel work won't take any impact of chain and all that sort of stuff. Um, but it's going to be quite a long drop, which is which is 
exactly what we want. We want that so that the chain can basically fall free and be, be nice and lovely down in that anchor room. Lowers the weight so the center of gravity goes down a bit, which is always good. Um, and it moves the weight back a wee bit from the bow. Not that it makes a huge difference in this boat, but every little bit counts. Now, the issue with doing all of that, the shelf, that the, the original shelf used to be above the waterline, so we could do a gravity feed straight out the side. The new arrangement won't be like that. The new arrangement will have the floor of the anchor room is lower than the waterline. So we're gonna be putting a stripping pump. This is pretty common in bigger ships. Um, basically, we need to build a sump though. So I'll show you what we're doing to accommodate the new stripping pump. This is our new pump. So this is a fairly, fairly decent size. Um, it's pretty, I think it's 18,000 gallons an hour or something. Like it's quite a, quite a beast of a pump. Um, it's got an inch and a half outlet coming out of it. So what we're gonna be doing, so this operates with a float switch, Just this is basically just a, a regular sort of, I think they call them bore pumps, that sort of thing. Um, runs off 240 volt power, so we're gonna be running power up to the front, so we'll have to waterproof all of that. We're not gonna be putting um, a plug into the, uh, into the anchor room, we're gonna be basically hard wiring it in, that way we're able to keep it a hell of a lot more watertight. Now what we need to do, we've got a piece of big diameter stainless tube, we're gonna sink that into the floor. So that there is gonna be below floor level. So all of the water will run down to that. That'll be the lowest point in the anchor room. And then this pump sits inside it and we'll be pumping the water out. And we'll make stainless pipe work to go up and out over the side. And it'll have a one-way valve in it as well. So um, it will be possible for a small amount of water to come in the boat, but it's not gonna be possible for large amounts to rush in. So now you understand what we're going to be doing. We're going to dive back down into the hole, mark out that new sump, and we'll start cutting that into the floor. But that's not till next week. Dame sized up the sump, cut the floor, made some of it out of an old keg, and got it welded in. He also cut out the front shelf. Uh, it needed a little bit of work, a bit of rust up there. And he started work on the accommodations downstairs. You got ice like summer sky. If it's my good kill, I die. And now it starts to rain, so let's enjoy it 